Imagine being able to use a single command to perform multiple actions just by changing the context. This power and this flexibility is at the heart of some of the most robust and scalable softwares ever built. And it all boils down to one fundamental concept in object-oriented programming called polymorphism. Let's get started. In today's video, we are diving deep into one of the most powerful pillars of object-oriented programming, polymorphism. In the next few minutes, you will learn what polymorphism really means and why is it so essential, the difference between compile time and runtime polymorphism, and how method overloading and method overriding is used to achieve these two types of polymorphism, the role of abstract methods and interfaces in achieving polymorphism, and how these concepts empower you to write code that is flexible, maintainable, and ready to scale. Polymorphism is a core concept in object-oriented programming, and it is a fundamental building block in c -sharp. The term comes from a Greek word meaning many forms, and that's exactly what polymorphism allows in programming. For a single method call to take many different forms depending on the context. Let's break it down with a simple, relatable example. Imagine you're at a coffee shop. You walk up to the counter and ask for coffee. In simplest form, you just get black coffee. But maybe today you want a little milk. Now same request, get coffee, turns to get coffee with milk. And tomorrow, maybe you want it with both milk and sugar. Still the same method, get coffee, but with milk and sugar. This is polymorphism in action. The same method name, get coffee, but implemented in different ways based on the parameters or the objects that's calling it. In C Sharp, this can be achieved through method overloading, which is compile time polymorphism, and method overriding, which is used in runtime polymorphism. Let us see what is compile time polymorphism in C Sharp. This is also known as static polymorphism or early binding. All the three names means the same. We will see why compile time polymorphism is also called as static polymorphism or early binding when we look at the example. This is a key concept in object-oriented programming that allows us to define multiple methods with the same name as long as their number of parameters are different, the data type is different, or the sequence of the parameters are different. Now let's understand this with a real-world example. Imagine you're building a payment system for an online store. Customers can pay using credit card, debit card, or gift cards. Let us implement this example using C Sharp without polymorphism. And then let's apply polymorphism to see what is the value it adds. Let's get started. We are creating a payment processor class with three methods, process credit card payment, process debit card payment, and process gift card payment each designated with a different responsibility. In the main, we are creating an object of the payment processor and consuming these three methods by passing their respective parameters. There is no problem in this code. It is going to work and going to produce the results that we need. But the point is, this can get better by applying compile time polymorphism. How it can get better? Instead of calling specific method names like process credit card payment, process debit card payment, or process gift card payment, we can abstract the idea of these three, call it process payment. How it gets better is the caller of this method gets the abstracted form of it, which is process payment. Okay, now let's look at this example in which we have applied compile time polymorphism or method overloading. Each method handles a different type of payment credit, debit, and gift card. Notice how all methods share the same name, but take different number of parameters. It can be, it can differ in number of parameters, type of parameters, or the sequence of parameters, but still have the same name. When we call process payment, the compiler chooses the correct method at compile time based on the arguments passed. This is a clean and efficient way to handle different payment flows. And it shows exactly why compile time polymorphism 
is so useful in real application. Okay, now let's see why method overloading also has two other names that is static polymorphism and early binding. It's because the method call is resolved at the compile time and not at the runtime. Static here refers to the fact that the decision is fixed even before the program starts running. It's not dynamic. And coming to early binding, it means that the method signature is bound to the method call early in the lifecycle during compilation instead of being decided while the program is running. This improves the performance and reduces error since the compiler can catch issues in the early stages during compilation. Now, before we could start with runtime polymorphism, I would like to show how method overloading that we have defined for the payment processor class takes action uh, in IntelliSense and how it looks great. When we use the processor object and we say dot process payment and we open the brace, immediately we get an IntelliSense which shows that this method that we are going to use, that is process payment, has three overloads the three overloads that we defined. We completed looking at compile time polymorphism and how it is achieved using method overloading. We also learned why method overloading is also called as static polymorphism or early binding. Now let's get started with runtime polymorphism. Runtime polymorphism, also called as dynamic polymorphism or late binding, all three of these terms essentially refer to the same mechanism, where method calls are resolved at the runtime rather than at the compile time. This is a powerful feature that allows programs to determine which method implementation to execute while the application is running, enabling more flexibility and bringing in more extensibility to the code. Let's look at this with an example exactly how runtime polymorphism works and why is it so essential for modern software development. Let's get started. Now let's see how to apply runtime polymorphism with a real world example. Imagine you're shopping online, you have added items to your cart, you're ready to check out and now you get to choose how to pay. The website gives you several options, credit, debit or maybe PayPal or something else. Behind the scenes, there is a generic payment system. It doesn't care which payment method you choose. It just wants to process the payment. So there is a base class called payment with a method called process. But each payment type, credit, debit, or PayPal, have their own ways to process the payment. That's where runtime polymorphism kicks in. Based on your selection, the program creates the right kind of payment object it could be a credit card payment, a debit card payment, or a PayPal payment. Even though the code calls the process method through a reference of the generic payment class, the actual method that runs is chosen at the runtime based on the object type. So if you choose a PayPal object, the PayPal processing logic runs. And if you pick credit card, the credit card logic runs. This is powerful because the decision about which method to run is made while the program is running, not when the code is first written or compiled. That's why we call it runtime or dynamic polymorphism, because the actual method binding happens dynamically as your program runs. It's also called late binding since the connection between the method call and the actual method is made late at the runtime rather than early during compilation, like method overloading. And that's what makes code flexible, scalable, and easy to extend. So we can see here, we have created a generic payment object, and based on an if-else, we create specific implementation objects, like credit card payment, debit card, or PayPal payment, based on the object that is being assigned to the generic object reference, the respective specific implementations will be invoked when we call the process method. This is basically used 
to give a more specific implementation rather than the generic process payment implementation. Now, based on the user choice, we have marked PayPal. So it will create a PayPal object. Let's run the example. And we can see that based on the object that we have created, the respective implementation of processing PayPal payment is invoked. Now that we have completed looking at runtime polymorphism and how using method overriding, we achieve runtime polymorphism, let's get started with the next concept, abstract methods. Think of an abstract class has a blueprint. Here we have an abstract class called vehicle, but notice this class just has a plan and for what a vehicle should be. It defines a method called start engine, but it doesn't actually say how to start the engine. It's like having a car blueprint no physical car, just the plan. By this, we are not getting married to a particular sort of implementation. No details yet on how things will work. Now let's say we build an actual car from the blueprint. We create a class called as car, which inherits from vehicle. This time the car knows exactly how its engine should start. In our code, the start engine method is implemented by igniting the engine. So the blueprint becomes a real working car with its own way to start the engine. But the vehicle can be different. Maybe we have a scooter instead of a car. Scooter don't ignite like car. They might power an electric motor. So we create another class scooter which also inherits from vehicle. Here we override the start engine method to provide a more specific implementation for start engine, like powering electric motor. Now let's look at a code example of abstract method. We have an abstract class shape with an abstract method get area and a property color. Abstract classes are used mostly to define a base class with some base contracts and some base unimplemented abstract methods. We have circle and rectangle which inherits from shape giving their own specific implementation how to calculate the area. And the base class just has an abstract method which just has a declaration and no method body. And the child class gives specific implementation of how this method has to work. So we use a base reference and we assign respective objects, circle and rectangle. And based on which object is used to call get area, the respective implementation will get triggered. Let's run this example. We can see that the first call was to calculate a circle's area and their respective methods, be it circle or rectangle, respective uh, get area method is called. We looked at abstract methods. We understood how it works with some real world examples. Now let's get started with interfaces. Let's learn how to define and implement interfaces how to implement multiple interfaces. And when we are implementing multiple interfaces, there is a possibility of two different methods with the same name in two different interfaces. How to solve that problem using explicit interface implementation. Let's get started. So what exactly is an interface? Think of an interface as a contract. It's a blueprint that defines a set of methods or properties but it does not provide the actual implementation. In simple terms, it tells you what needs to be done, which is actually the contract, not how it should be done. Imagine you're signing a contract for a new job. The contract lists the tasks you are expected to do, like attending meetings, submitting reports, or managing a team, but it doesn't tell you how you should accomplish those tasks. That's up to you. 
Similarly, an interface defines what class should do, but leaves how it has to be done to the class that implements it. Let's get started with an example. Now let's look at this example of smart home devices. We have three interfaces, iPower with basic functionality of turn on and turn off in the, in the contract. iConnect with the functionality of connect to Wi-Fi. Again, just a contract, a blueprint with no implementation. And we have the third interface, which is iVoice control with a contract of execute command. Let's see how this will be implemented. We have smart light that implements iPower, iConnect, and iVoice control. This is how we implement multiple interfaces. So smart light implements iPower, iConnect, and iVoice control, and it implements the functionality turn on and turn off, which is in the contract of iPower, abiding with what needs to be satisfied for iPower. And then it implements connect to Wi-Fi, which satisfies the interface iConnect. The contract that is connect to Wi-Fi is implemented. And the third interface, which is iVoice control, is implemented, but we need to make a note that the way it is implemented is using iVoice control dot execute command. So that is explicit interface implementation. When we say iVoice control dot execute command, that means that we are giving implementation to the execute command of the iVoice control contract. So if there is any other contract which has the same execute command method, it will not collide. So if we don't do an explicit interface implementation, if you are inheriting from multiple interfaces, if there is two methods with the same name, then you will end up with a compile time error. So to avoid that, when we inherit from multiple interfaces, we use explicit interface implementation to avoid this error. We learned how to define and implement interfaces how to implement multiple interfaces, and how to explicitly implement interface. Thank you for watching our video. Do subscribe our channel for more such videos and thank you for your support.